once I stopped trying to be a writer and a movie star. And, you know, that was a huge thing because it took me many years to understand what that was all about. What did the shaman really mean? And only looking back, having done all that I've accomplished, do I realize that if you have a dream, if you are a writer or an actor or I don't know, whatever your dream is, and you're not pursuing that dream because you're afraid to fail or because you're tired of failing and you just give up and you just like try to settle, you know, settle. Well, you might as well be dead. I have a hell of a show for you. Our next guest, he tells his story, how he went from being Hollywood's next great producer to becoming a taxi driver for 15 years to becoming a multi-million dollar author. What I like most about Clint Arthur's story is that he reminds us that no matter what race, what religion, or what side of the crosswalk you grew up on, we are all living life. We're all having struggles and we're all trying to figure things out. In this show, we're gonna review his book, The Wisdom of Men. Now, before I give you any more detail than that, what I want you to do is to hit that subscribe button. Right now, 98% of you guys aren't subscribed, so hit that subscribe button. And if you're listening on any of our streaming networks, follow us and give us a five-star review. Anyways, my name is Deron Brown, and this is the podcast, Philosophy for Life. Okay, so you found out your mother cheated on your father, conceived you, and you found this out when you were when you graduated from college. Can you tell us about that story? Well, I went home to get the congratulations from graduating from the Wharton Business School, the number one top business school in the whole entire world. And I figured it was going to be a love fest. But instead, my parents get into the hugest argument of all time. And they were arguing their whole lives. But this was the biggest one ever. My dad storms out of the house, slams the door. I'm sitting on the couch next to my mom. And I go, you know, mom. The way he resents you all these years, have you been cheating on dad? And I'm thinking, holy cow, where did that question come from? I never even thought that question even one time in my whole life. And then I'm thinking, wow, what a rude person I have become to ask my own mother a rude question like that. That's the rudest thing I ever said to anybody. And then I'm thinking, how come she ain't answering the question? And I see this vein. On the side of her neck, it goes boom, 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 boom. And then she swallows. He's not your real father. Your real father was a doctor at the fertility clinic we went to for six years trying to have you. And you look just like that guy. And she was like relieved. Hmm. And I'm like mind blown, you know, because in a split second, everything I thought I knew about who I was, poof, gonzo. So I sure as heck didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up anymore. And Monday morning comes and I call up the investment bank on the 87th floor of number one World Trade Center. Mr. Vice President, I appreciate the offer to become an investment banker with your firm, but I decided I've been working for this my whole life, but suddenly it's not important to me anymore. I don't want to be an investment banker. So thank you, but no thank you for your offer. And then what do I do? Naturally, I ran off to Hollywood. And uh, the crazy thing happens, man. I, I I get to Los Angeles and I had this idea. This is 1988. The media was obsessed with the trash crisis in America. Well, before before we continue into that, I want to touch base on like you finding out who your your father was. So, how did that impact your relationship with your with your father, the guy who raised you? Yeah, it it you know, uh, it impacted my relationship with both of my parents for a long time. Okay, and uh, not in a good way, you know, because I, I had been living in a lie. And I didn't want to be part of that anymore. So I moved out to Hollywood to kind of reinvent myself. And, you know, I I was in my early 20s. So that's a very independent phase of life anyway, or at least it was for me. But, you know, I, I moved to Hollywood and started writing screenplays and thinking I was going to become 
the white version of Spike Lee. This was during the independent film mania when he produced She's Gotta Have It for like a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. And I wanted to be him. And I started writing screenplays and trying to make a movie happen. And uh, you know, it, it was not easy. And yeah, we're- and my parents felt like I was like wasting my life, you know, and all my golden opportunities. I hear you. Did you ever meet your biological father or try to or try to find him? I tried very hard, of course. You know, I'm a I'm a persistent person and I tried very, very hard to find him. And I was never able to track him down. Okay. Tried three times. And and you know, look, I've I've been pursuing celebrity and a lot of people don't understand that celebrity is not the same thing as being famous okay being a celebrity means that a certain group thinks that you're famous or that you're special i've been trying to be special my whole life that's why i went to the wharton business school that's why i i've done all the things that i've done i've done 135 tv appearances i've written 21 best selling books i've spoken at harvard at at University of, of Southern California Business School, USC Business School, Oxford, Cambridge, London Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, Mercedes, Coca-Cola. I've shared the stage with Martha Stewart, Ice T, Dr. Oz, Caitlyn Jenner. And, and, you know, I say all these things not to impress you, but just to impress upon you. I've been really working hard at becoming a celebrity. And, and for a long time, I thought, that on a subconscious level, that was all about me wanting to get so famous that my real dad would see me yeah. and that daddy would love me. And I suppose that there's an element of that. But, you know, as I got older, I, I wrote a book for my daughter when she was like five years old. And it was called Daddy Loves You. It was a little children's book, bedtime story, you know, because I, I, I only I got kicked out of the house when she was a year old because her mom became a big hotshot executive in Hollywood. And I was still pursuing my Hollywood dream and I was driving a taxi to pay the bills and she didn't want to be burdened with a loser hanging around when she was a big hotshot in Hollywood. So she kicked me out of the house. And uh, a couple of years later, I, I drew and, and it, illustrated and wrote this little book called daddy loves you. Cause I wanted my daughter to know that even though I only saw her on Wednesday nights, the other nights of the week, daddy still loved her. And for many years, you know, I, I thought I wrote that book for my daughter and somehow I'm not quite sure how exactly or why, but really I wrote that book for me because you know, I carry him. I'm, I have a dog. It's a Shiba Inu. She weighs 20 pounds and I carry her around a lot. And I whisper in her ear a lot, daddy loves you, baby, daddy loves you. And I realize, I, you know, your dogs are here to unburden you. You're, you know, there's dogs that take cancers off you. There's dogs that take illnesses off you. Well, this has been a big illness for me, a big hole in my soul, not knowing my biological father. Hmm. So I keep saying to my dog, daddy loves you, baby. Daddy loves you. And I realized I was saying that to my dog because I was saying it to myself. And somehow that goes back to this book, daddy loves you. And I'm not exactly quite sure whether I've, I've, I wrote that, I wrote that book for me. I wrote that book to, to, was that a message from my biological father that he loved me? Was that a message from the universe that my biological father loved me? Was that a message from the father in me to the inner child in me that daddy loved me? I don't know. I'm, I'm still trying you know, to figure it out. You know, um, as I told you, I, I listened to your audiobook seven times. The first time I listened to it, it was passive. But every time after that, I learned something new. It cracked me up. And I laughed not because I was laughing at you. It's because a lot of young men, including myself, especially in your 20s, you feel like you know everything. You feel like you have to be perfect. You have to date the perfect woman. You want to impress your family. You want to have the, the perfect life. And then once you once life just doesn't turn out the way that you expect it to, expect it to. you know, a lot of times you feel like because you go to a specific college, you know, I was a collegiate athlete, you know, um, first to graduate from high school, first to get my master's in college. I thought my family would be proud of me, but um, I got a lot of envy and hate 
hatred from that. And then just reading your book and then knowing you grew up in a traditional family household, you, you know, you knew Robert Downey Jr. when you were a kid. You went to a great, great high school from great high school. You went to a great college and then you still wind up experiencing bullshit, too. You know, so it just lets me know everybody's trying to figure out life. I got a question for you. Why did you write this book? And what do you hope readers get from the book? Well, in 2000, in December of 2000, I took this seminar called The Men's Weekend. And there was really my life before The Men's Weekend and after The Men's Weekend. Because for some reason, by, by the year 2000, I was afraid of men. Maybe it was because I got robbed when I was a taxi driver by a man. And, you know, kicked in my window it was one of the scariest things that ever happened. When I drove a taxi for six years and I had only a couple of, you know, scary things, but that was really scary. And I was afraid of men. And after the men's weekend, I wasn't afraid of men anymore. And uh, after, after the men's weekend, I got involved with a men's self-help team. These were all guys who had graduated from the same seminar. And. I became the leader of that team and I got my executive officer to get the men to change the name of the team from kryptonite junkies from the 17th hell. That was the original name of the team to the men, something ridiculous to something serious. And we used to always have this session of our meetings where we would circle up around the campfire in our camping chairs and, and I would say, okay, is there any man who needs the wisdom of the men? And if a man had a problem, he would just tell us about the problem. And the whole what kind of problems that they have, what kind of problems that they have, every, every kind of problem, like, you know, I haven't talked to my daughter in five years, or uh, I'm going to, I'm going to get fired from my job because I'm not passionate about it anymore. And I'm just phoning it in, or I got $2,800 in payday loans and I can't get rid of them and it's eating me up alive. I mean, you know, men have problems, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they have all kinds of problems and whatever it was, when we would do the wisdom of the men, a special energy would come into the circle. It was like from generations of men. It was no longer just, we, it wasn't us. It was mankind that was providing the wisdom of the men. And I wanted to create that kind of experience for the reader. And I wanted to write a book that encapsulated everything that I had learned from all the smartest men in the world. All the best lessons that I've learned in my life are in that book. And they come from international superstars like Caitlyn Jenner and Mike Tyson and Buzz Aldrin and five presidents of the United States, Bill Clinton, George H.W. Bush, Jimmy Carter, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden. And, you know, the lessons are not what you expect. Some of the lessons don't come from the actual person. It comes from the whole circumstance around the person. Like, for example, with Joe Biden, you know, the one of my fraternity brothers was the last partner. Like, on New Year's Eve of the millennium, I'm driving a taxi. And in the backseat of my cab are these two kids who are MBA interns at Goldman Sachs. I'm listening to their conversation. Hey, man, did you hear about Mr. Carrera? They made him the last partner right before the Goldman IPO and he cashed out a gazillion dollars. And I'm like, are you talking about Chris Carrera? How do you know Mr. Carrera? Chris Carrera was one of my fraternity brothers and that was who they were talking about. And one day, while I'm still a taxi driver, I find out Chris Carrera is throwing a huge party at the Four Seasons restaurant on Park Avenue because he's got hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, everybody's invited. All, if you're a fraternity brother, you just got to show up. And my dad's like, I'll send you a plane ticket. I'll, the dad who raised me, I'll say, I'll pay for your hotel. You got to go to that party. I'm like, dad, I can't go to that party. They're going to say, what are you doing? Clint, what are you up to? And I'm like, Hey man, I just broke the record. $513 driving a cab on new year's Eve. They're all making millions and billions. I can't show up at that party. But then I got out of taxi driving and I got into the gourmet food industry. I, I, you know, I just, I got to the point where I gave up on my dream. 13 years of chasing the Hollywood dream was enough of throwing my life away. And, and I, and I gave it up and I just wanted to have a normal life. I, I just wanted to make money and get married and maybe buy a house one day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, then something happened. Then on the men's team, the shaman 
was pointing at me across the yellow and orange crackling campfire. And he goes, you don't know it yet, but you're already dead. And I'm like, what are you talking about, man? I'm the most successful guy on this team. Eight years ago, I was a cab driver. Now I'm a millionaire. I was living on a little boat. Now I live in a mansion. You're already dead. You just don't know it. And I really didn't know what he was talking about. But I would wake up in the middle of the night out of a sound sleep. I'm already dead. What does he mean? And it came to be New Year's Day of 2009. And I asked myself a question inspired by that night at the campfire with the shaman. I said, I don't know what it means to already be dead, but what if I was going to die at the end of this year? What if this was going to be the last year of my life? What would I want to accomplish? And that influence of the shaman broke me through all kinds of procrastination, fear, and doubt. And the first thing I wanted to accomplish that year was write my book about what I learned at the Wharton Business School that helped me to become successful as a businessman. Once I stopped trying to be a writer and a movie star. And, you know, that was a huge thing because it took me many years to understand what that was all about. What did the shaman really mean? And only looking back, having done all that I've accomplished, do I realize that. If you have a dream, if you are a writer or an actor or I don't know, whatever your dream is, and you're not pursuing that dream because you're afraid to fail or because you're tired of failing and you just give up and you just like try to settle, you know, settle, well, you might as well be dead. Let's, um, let's, re let's fast, let's rewind real fast. Um, you mentioned your daughter. You mentioned the relationship that you had with the your baby mother. Can you go over the story, how you met her and um, what your relationship was like before you met her? I know that you were seeing um, a famous producer, is a Copelson, design daughter. Can you, yeah. So can you talk about your relationship with her and, and also how you met your baby mother and how that how things ended up the way they ended up? So when I moved out to L.A., I had this entrepreneurial idea inspired by the trash crisis. The media was crazy about trash in 1988. That was the environmental crisis du jour. And I came up with this idea. I'm going to transform trash into artwork by putting it in clear plastic boxes and signing my name on it. And I'm, I only have suits and ties because I was going to be an investment banker. So I'm going along Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills, picking through the garbage cans in my suit and tie. And there's this restaurant there called the Daisy Cafe. And I get into a conversation with the owners and I tell them I'm making sculptures to protest the trash crisis. And they invite me to have an exhibit in the back of their restaurant. So no kidding, a month after I moved to LA, I have a trash art exhibit on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. The LA Times picks up my press release and my picture of me in my suit and tie pulling garbage out of the garbage cans in Beverly Hills is on the front page of the LA Times. And then the CBS News sends a camera crew and NBC News sends a camera crew. And the next day I get a call from my best friend in the fraternity's father. He was a movie producer and I knew him because he had visited my, my roommate, my best friend, Evan, several times while we were in college. And I had gone to dinner with them and he calls me up the next day and he goes, hey, I'm watching you right now on CBS News. I always knew you were going to be special. Well, you don't, you shouldn't believe everything you see on TV because even though it appeared like I was a successful Beverly Hills artist, I didn't sell any of those sculptures. And I had to take a job bussing tables in a Mexican restaurant. And that lasted only like two weeks before the manager calls me in his office. He's like, hey, gringo, the waiters tell me that you're eating the food, the leftovers off the customer's place. That's disgusting. You're fired. Get out of here. I was starving. So I'm hanging out at Ev's house in his parents' big mansion in Beverly Hills because they got a huge refrigerator full of food. Yeah. And one day his sister shows up. She's an art student in college. And I, I was like painting paintings in the, in the garage. He let me use that as, the, as my studio. And she goes, hey, I'm Stephanie. What are you doing? And I go, I'm painting, painting. She goes, do you want to paint me? And I go, sure, take off all your clothes. And she does. <laughs> And, you know, that was the day we began a very hot and heavy romance. And a couple of days later, I get another call from the father. Hey, 
I want you to come and work for me on one of my pictures. I got a movie starring Sean Young and Tommy Lee Jones and Nicolas Cage. It's like Top Gun with Apache attack, attack helicopters. And I go to work as a production assistant on this movie. For, it's a real movie called Firebirds. And I'm making $400 a week. And I got my own hotel room and three meals a day from catering. But I'm sweeping floors and getting cappuccinos. And one day... I get up the courage to ask Tommy Lee Jones. He's like drinking at the bar after, after production is done at the hotel. And I go up to him and I say, sir, do you have any advice for a young man entering the movie business? And he goes, yeah, don't be boring. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, then, and then Arnold Copelson comes and visits the set and he goes, hey, you know something? You're even better looking than Nicolas Cage. And I go, yeah, right. If I'm so good looking, how come I'm not the star of this movie? And he goes, because nobody would give me the millions of dollars that I need to make this movie if it was starring you. It's not about good looks or talent. It's only about, can you bring an audience? And then the mother goes, hey, we're going to Acapulco for vacation for Christmas and New Year. You should come with Stephanie. And I go, wow. And we go on this amazing vacation to Acapulco, Mexico in this gorgeous villa. I mean, most people never even dream of having a honeymoon like this. We had our own big suite yeah. and a king size bed. And when I wasn't making love to Stephanie in the king size bed, I was smoking joints the size of my finger with my best friend and his dad, the Academy Award winning producer, Arnold Copelson, who produced Platoon. And Unfortunately, Stephanie and I were just kids. And as often happens, young love faded away. And when she was no longer in my life, neither was the father helping me. Do you, so, do you think that was a bad move? I mean, I was just, I was going through all the scenarios in your life through your book. And um, I was thinking about, man, if you could have made this move at this crossroad, you know, all of us have that situation. Do you think that that would have been a good move to keep her as your girl and, you know, rise up in Hollywood potentially as a producer? Dude, it would not have been potentially rising up in Hollywood, okay? Uh, after the vacation, I go back to working on the movie set, and the other executive producer of the movie comes up to me one day and puts his arm around me up my shoulder. I've never talked to him before. And he okay. goes, hey, I understand. Congratulations are in order. I'm like, really? Why is that? He goes, oh, I hear you're marrying Stephanie Copelson. I go, I am? <laughs> I was just a kid. I didn't want to get married. Yeah. But her brother had a boyfriend who became his husband. And that guy became the senior executive vice president of Arnold Copelson Productions and became wow. the executive producer of many, 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 many big studio feature films. So, so it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't an if <laughs> question, man. If I had done that, I, but I was too young and stupid. I didn't, didn't think I needed anybody's help to conquer Hollywood. I wanted to be the white Spike Lee doing independent feature films. And I was going to, you know, be a big star. I didn't realize how naive I was about the Why do you, why do you, well, first off, Stephanie Copelson, she's still in art. I checked her out. I looked her up and she still has an art studio. She's still doing her thing yeah. in the art scene. Why do you think a lot of young men, when they're 18 and 19, they just, they have like blinders or they have, uh, you know, ear muscle on when it comes to receiving wisdom from men who lived, you know, decades before they did. Like what was why do why do young men do that? They'd be like, believe they know they know everything. Well, I think that's the nature of kids is that, you know, it's it's a lot easier to succeed all the way through to the end of college than it is after college. But even after college, I became, you know, super famous as an artist. Really, I was in Time Magazine, National Enquirer, People Magazine in Australia. I was globally famous. I'm not even joking. And uh, I thought I could do anything. I didn't, I did not realize. I didn't, and I didn't even understand how to parlay that fame as an artist into becoming a movie star. I didn't even understand how to do that. I didn't know anything. It's a huge, huge world. And when you're a kid, you only see like a little piece of the world that you want. And you go and you pursue that little piece. And I was able to, to get every little piece that I wanted. All the little pieces were mine. But the world is made up of so many little pieces. When you start wanting big pieces of the world, it becomes much, much harder to get those pieces. So, 
you know, I would encourage any young man to listen to my book because in the book I go through and I, I look back with the eyes of a person who has become successful, you know, despite dri driving a taxi for six years, I have gone on to turn my life around and I'm, we're going to be celebrating our 20th wedding anniversary, my wife and I in November. And, you know, we live like Kings in our mansion in Mexico. And before you know, we get to that, cause we're definitely going to get into that relationship. Yeah. So you got George Clooney's ex pregnant or the love is life pregnant. How did that, um, how did that happen, man? I mean, you're a taxi driver. How did you meet her? Okay. Well, before I was a taxi driver, okay, I, I, I had a bunch of credit cards. See, after, after I worked on the movie for Arnold Copelson, I got a bunch of credit cards and I was going to produce my independent film. And I started writing screenplays and going to film festivals. And I was at the Sundance Film Festival and I see this woman in a beautiful coat and I go, wow, that's a really cool coat. She goes, thank you. I make these coats out of antique blankets. I'm Sarah. And I'm like, I'm Clint. She goes, where are you going, Clint? I'm going to this movie. Oh, I am too. I guess we're going together. We go to that movie. Then we go to a party. Then back in LA, she invites me to go to see one of her clients starring in a movie. And then our next date, we go to a restaurant. We walk into the restaurant and she goes, oh, look, there's George Clooney. Let's go say hello. So we go over to George Clooney. Hey, George, how you doing? And George Clooney's like, Oh, Sarah, I am so fucking wasted right now. She goes, well, this is Clint Arthur. And I shake his hand and he introduces us to some tall drink of water that he's with on a date. And then she goes, congratulations on ER, George. I always knew you were going to make it. And then we go sit down to have our dinner at the table. And I'm like, how do you know George Clooney? Because ER at that point was like the hottest TV show in Hollywood on television. He was the hottest actor in Hollywood. And she goes, Oh, I used to be his agent for 10 years. And I always knew George Clooney was going to be George Clooney. And he always knew he was going to be George Clooney, but you know who didn't know he was going to be George Clooney? Hollywood didn't know. And for 10 years, he would get pilot after pilot. He'd be on show after show. And he would always get fired or it would get screwed up because Hollywood didn't believe in George Clooney, but he did and that's why when you're talent in Hollywood, you got to have a long-term view because it's going to take you at least 10 years to make it in Hollywood. And that became my number, right? That was my number. And one night, so look, shortly thereafter, that's when Sarah and I got romantically involved. And it wasn't very long before our daughter was conceived. And now Sarah's like, hey, I need you to help me with this pregnancy. I need you to move in. And then when the baby comes, we're going to need to move into a bigger house. And, you know, I thought that she was a hotshot talent manager in Hollywood. But it turned out when I moved in with her that I realized she was coasting on fumes just like me. And pretty soon both of us had maxed out our credit cards. And so that's when I started looking for jobs. I called up the investment bank on the 87th floor of number one World Trade Center. I said, can I get that job now? And the guy's like, are you crazy? You're 30 years old. You haven't done anything. I got young MBAs hitting me up every single day. You had your shot. You blew it. So I saw a billboard for the LAPD. It said, you get paid $49,000 a year just to go to the police academy. I applied to the LAPD. They turned me down. They go, you have too much credit card debt. That makes wow. you vulnerable to bribery and you all these speeding tickets you have it demonstrates your disrespect for law so i take a job driving a yellow cab in los angeles wharton business school graduate and i'm making 200 dollars a night driving six nights a week from 6 p.m to 6 a.m and once I'm paying all the bills and we move into the big house and I'm paying for the diapers and the formula and the nanny and everything, all of a sudden Sarah's career explodes and she has six of her clients get booked to star on network TV shows. And she becomes a hot big shot in Hollywood. And she throws this big party to celebrate her success and as all these beautiful, young, successful actors are walking into the party at five o'clock for the barbecue and the, and the drinks, I'm walking out to get in my cab and go drive a taxi. And one of our beautiful actress friends goes, Clint, where are you going? I'm like, work. 
George Clooney showed up that night at that party. And there's a picture in the book of him holding my daughter in the photo with another guy who played O.J. Simpson in the O.J. Simpson story, the Fox miniseries, right? And I'm not in the photo, just my daughter and, and, and O.J. and George Clooney and mm-hmm. because I couldn't show up at that party. I could have taken the night off. I didn't yeah. have to. There's nobody forcing you to go drive a taxi, but I yeah. couldn't be at that party. I couldn't show up and be the only one who was a failure. And now Woody Allen, he says, 80% of life is just showing up. So if you're not showing up, what are you living? 20%? That's what I was living. Damn, man. Why? What did you say? You said that she, in your book, you mentioned that she wanted to split up. You said, hey, let's go and see a... um... One day she calls me in her office. She goes... She has a home office in the house that I'm paying for. She goes, hey, come in my office for a second. Have a seat. It's not working out. We had an affair, but it's run its course. And it's not working anymore. And I'm like, but Sarah, we're engaged to get married. I know, I know, but it's just not working. Now, I never in a million years could imagine that I wasn't going to get married to Sarah and live the rest of my life with her and my daughter. See, I come from a traditional family. My parents hated each other and argued constantly, but they they stayed together because that's what you do in a traditional family. You work it out. But, you know, Sarah had been in Hollywood for so long. She had seen so many marriages break up that, you know, it was not a big deal for her. And, you know, a lot of people say I wasn't really engaged to her. I was really the semen donor, but whatever the case may be, uh, I said, well, let's, can we go to counseling? And she goes, okay. And a week later, we're on a plane flying up to Oregon to go visit her family at their berry farm. And the baby is in between us in the seat in between us. And she leans over the baby and says, when we get back to LA, I want you to move out. You really need to move out. And next morning I wake up at four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, do you really want me to move out when we get back to LA? She's like, I'm like, take me to the airport right now. And I get on a plane. I fly back to LA. I pack up all my stuff. And I'm at when everything's all packed up and loaded into my, into my uh, SUV. I'm hanging out with her best friend, Val, who was house sitting for us. And we're drinking wine and I'm smoking pot and I'm bawling my eyes out, crying. I was so devastated. And Val goes, what do you think you could have done different? And I'm like, I could have been more. And Tony Robbins says that at the core, every single person is afraid that you're not enough. You're not enough of a father, of a of a man, of a provider, whatever it is that you are, you're not enough. And that was just so classic that it just came right out of my mouth. I could have mm-hmm. been more. That's exactly why what I said. in your book, you mentioned you pissed her off and then she broke up with you. Do you, you <laughs> are know, you comfortable saying that? <laughs> you know, look, I, Whatever, you know, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't going to work. You know, I, I, yeah. I didn't bring the stroller on the trip. I liked holding my baby. I liked it holding was, my daughter. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to put her in a stroller. I wanted to just carry her around. She was my little buddy. You know, it was an excuse. It was an excuse. She wanted it to be over. So yeah. <laughs> another, you know, we never went well, to wrestling. How does a, you mentioned the various type of men, women that men uh, should date. There's a one women that are always popular that have a hot name, like the the famous athletes, you know things like that. Or you should date the woman that had that you have a chemical connection with. Uh-huh. When it comes to really choosing a wife, man, like honestly, with all your wisdom, how should a man actually vet a woman before he makes her his wife? Okay, well, you should never get married to a person unless you have that chemical connection with them. You got to have chemistry. And unless you do, then you're just like talking yourself into it. 
You know, you got to, you should really be passionate about the person that you're going to marry. And on top of it, you got to have the hard conversation. I mean, I literally said to my wife before we got engaged, I said, look, are you secretly a drug addict or an alcoholic or a codependent? Like, tell me what your problems are because I need to know. And she's like, I don't, I don't have any of those problems. So, you know, you got to, you have to find a person who you have the chemical connection with. And also they're not a complete psycho. Cause there's a lot, you know, a lot of times yeah. <laughs> my wife's like, I'm not a complete psycho. A lot of times, uh, you know, you have the chemical connection with a chick who's a, a psycho because they're the hottest ones in bed, right? So you got to make sure you're not getting married to a psycho who's just into drama. It's all about her. See, like when I was with my daughter's mother, my agenda was not part of the agenda. It, it was all her agenda. She didn't care about my agenda. And you got to yeah. find a person who cares about you and your agenda. And, you know, what I have with my wife is unbelievable because we have the same agenda. We, we have a, a vision for what we do and how to be successful. And we're always working with each other and for each other to develop and enhance our success together. You know, I'm not saying it, it, it hasn't had its problems. You know, we, we went to counseling for three years. After, after we hit the seven-year itch, we went to counseling for three years, and that saved our marriage, you know? But what is the, the seven-year itch all about? You know, why do you think? Because obviously, you guys have been together for a long time. Why, yeah. do you think, why do you think that happens? Well, it's interesting. You know, a lot of times you'll meet people, and they're together for seven years and then they break up. If you don't get married to, if you're with a person, like something's going to happen after seven years. And I, and you know what I think it is? I think after seven years, every single cell in your body has changed. Isn't that right? That's yeah, that's right. Every single cell in your body has been transformed over the course of seven years. So you're not the same person anymore that you were when you first met them. You're a completely different person but your soul is the same. You're just a, a different in a different vessel. So I, I think that has something to do with it. I mean, there's if if every cell of your body is different, it's possible that the chemical connection that you have could change. I don't, you know, that's that's the best I can figure on the spot like that. I'm not a chemist or anything, but who's whose advice out of all the men you met in your life, whose advice resonated the most with you? Um, the, the most important thing I ever learned. Well, look, when I met Mick Jagger, I said, sir, Mick, what's the most important thing you ever learned? He goes, you can't always get what you want, but if you try, sometimes you find you get what you need. And that is something that I'm constantly, like, I listen to that song all the time. That's lyrics from his song. You can't always get what you want. And, you know, okay, great. He's just quoting lyrics, but it, it's an amazing song. And I listen to it all the time, trying to understand the wisdom of that. Because, you know, I, I wanted to write that book for my daughter, but I needed to write that book for me. Daddy loves you. So that has been a very big thing for me. But then one of my college professors was this super smart guy who had a 40-year tenured professorship in the Ivy Leagues. His name was Digby Baltzell. And he invented the term WASP, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. That's a pretty pop, like the kids still know that term these days. Mm. Yeah. I don't know what that is. I never you, heard of WASP. You never heard of WASP? No. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, no. it's really funny. I saw a Broadway show the other night and the guy was talking about the different kinds of white that there, that you can be. Okay. This is some Jewish guy and he went to, and this is like white, also the different type of what white person you can be a different kind of white person oh. you can be. Okay. All right. Tell me. And, and he <laughs> said, and this was just the other night on Broadway and he goes, the highest level of white person that you can be is a white Anglo Saxon Protestant because the wasps, 
control all of government. Like George Bush is a wasp, okay? White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So the guy who invented that term was my professor, Digby Baltzell. He wrote it in a book called Social Stratification in America, where he was analyzing who is really ruling America. And one day he comes into class and it was the last class he ever taught because he was retiring at the end of the year. And I was like on the edge of my, of my seat and I'm like looking at him as he's getting all misty. And he goes, do you want to know how you know if you've lived a successful life? And I'm like, and he says, if by the time you die, you have one true friend, that's how you know you've lived a successful life. And I thought about that when I was deciding whether I was going to get married to my wife, Allie, because I realized that at that moment, he was really thinking of his wife. And, you know, as you get older, how old are you now? 35. Oh, you're just a baby. I'm 57 mm -hmm. years old for, I got like less, I got a month of 57 left and then I'm 58. Okay. And uh, as you get older, like at 35, you still got a lot of friends. As you get older, you're going to have less and less friends. You're going to have less and less people. You're going to want to call somebody. And there's going to be less and less people who you could call, if anybody. Why is that? Why is that? You know, uh, I lost a lot of friends over politics recently. Dumb, dumb reasons, you know. Mm. Uh, people, unfortunately you lose a lot of people because life is hard. And just the way I couldn't show up for that party that Chris Carrera threw at the four seasons, when you stop hearing from people, it's because things are not going well in their own life. That's usually why people drop out. They can't show up anymore. See, showing up is everything. And lucky for me, after I started developing my celebrity, after I got on the Today Show, my 57th TV appearance, I was interviewed by Brooke Shields and Willie Geist on the Today Show. And they go, you ask yourself a question every year, Clint, what's that question? And I said, ask yourself if this was going to be the last year of your life, what would you want to accomplish? Because that's been my superpower. Mm -hmm. And after I got on that show, a couple months later, I find out Chris Carrera is throwing another party for everybody in the fraternity at the Four Seasons restaurant. And I go to that party because now I'm successful. I, I was just on the Today Show a couple months earlier. And I felt like, you know, I felt like I was somebody at that point and that I could show up at that party and talk about what was going on in my life and not be embarrassed like I used to be about being a cab driver and a failure. So I show up at that party and there's Secret Service agents patting everybody down and wanding them down. He had to go through a metal detector. And I asked Chris Carrera, hey, man, what's going on? And he goes, Joe Biden is going to be the speaker. Because Joe Biden's son, the one who died of brain cancer, he was one of our fraternity brothers. And Joe Biden was six feet away from me talking for 15 minutes about how much his dead son, Bo Biden, loved our fraternity and how meaningful it was for him to be brothers and friends with all of us. And I shot a video of that whole thing. And that's one of the bonus videos you could get when you get Wisdom of the Men, the book, as any version of the book tells you how to you, get that bonus you video. Just, you just um, taught me something. I remember in, um, my high school reunion was when I was 28 years old. And um, a good friend of mine, for like the last three years prior to that reunion, our high school reunion, he was telling me, hey, man, I can't wait to go. When we go, we're going to do this, all this. We're going to see these women. We're going to do all these different types of things. And he's actually in California. So I grew up in California, the Bay Area. So I bought my ticket to fly back out to California to go to our high school reunion. And um, I'm thinking that he's going to show up. That's the only reason I'm going. I get there. He's not there. So I'm pissed off. So I text him. 
He doesn't respond to my text messages. He doesn't answer my calls. So the night ends good. I see some of my old friends. You know, I catch up with old high school crushes. And um, I hit him up at words. And I remember our, the conversation we had, but he gave me some, some bullshit answer. And um, I'm just listening to your story. I'm thinking that he didn't feel like he was enough because we went to a really, it was a private Catholic school. We went to school with politicians, kids, famous athletes, kids, certain parts of the area. You're like there's certain cities that are named after like the grandparents, their kids and their kids, you know? So he, I could see what he was going through because he felt like he, he was the he was the most popular guy in high school. You know what I'm saying? He was like the OJ Simpson in our high school. Everybody loved him. He could talk to everybody, but life didn't go the way that he expected to go, man. You know, it's you you did a lot for me with that answer, dude. More than you more than you know. I'm good. I'm happy to hear that, man. I, I mean Why? hopefully he'll be able to show up at some point in the future because I got my selfie with Joe Biden that night. And I was the only person who got a selfie with Joe Biden. Nobody else had the conness to go up to him and ask him for a selfie before he got whisked away by the Secret Service. But I got my mm. selfie with him. And the reason I got my selfie with him is because I had developed my personal power and I had the ambition to connect with famous people because I know that that's important for business and I could show up. If I hadn't been able to show up, I never would have got my selfie with my fifth president of the United States. You know, I was so naive in college because I, growing up, I was always a pretty good looking guy. I was always a top athlete. I went to college. I played college ball, D1 college ball. So I always was used to getting attention. And um, there were always like groupies, women who were, you know, they want to be around the athletes. I never messed with those girls. I thought I was above being an athlete. And I was like, oh, I'm not messing with these girls. I'm going to, I can get girls without this. Same thing when it came to fraternities. And I didn't really understand like... It's a lot harder when you're not within those uh, when you don't have that level of social proof to get a girl. You can get girls, but it's it's the the game is different. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't really I really didn't fully understand like why women were wired that way until I read your book. And it does that people are people are attracted to people who are popular, who are famous, who are known. And if you're with known people, they just they they naturally just approve of you. You know, it's a little. Yeah. It's a magical thing. I mean, it, you know, for me, I've only created my celebrity as a marketing tool since I've been married, you know, but e even in the beginning, my wife didn't understand it. She called up one of my best friends who was one of my fraternity brothers that I went to high school with. And she goes, why does he keep going on all these TV shows? Isn't, he, isn't his ego big enough? And luckily, the guy that she called is somebody that I had told. My plan was to get kind of famous so that I could be seen as a guru, somebody special, somebody kind of famous. And that would enable me to attract high net worth clients to pay me a lot of money. And that was the plan, always was the plan. And luckily, it's worked out really great, you know? So I haven't really uh, experienced the whole social value of it, except that. You know, I, I, I've been able to meet a lot of celebrities and become friends with some ce celebrities. You know, Suzanne Summers comes to mind. Her and her friend, her and her husband, Alan, are friends of ours after we've hired them a couple of times. And, uh, you know, but I saw I saw Suzanne Summers at Arnold Copelson's funeral. She was the uh, first eulogy at Arnold Copelson's funeral. And it was a really moving experience for me because when I went to that funeral, only then did I realize that my whole career had been inspired by and influenced and guided by his career as a celebrity entrepreneur. You know, people listening to this have probably never heard the name Arnold Copelson before, but this guy was the king of Hollywood. He made 29 A feature films, including The Fugitive and The Devil's Advocate with Al Pacino and Keanu Reeves and Seven with Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman and uh, Eraser with Arnold Schwarzenegger, which was a hundred million dollar movie for Warner Brothers. The people who knew him were the studio heads and the movie stars and the top talent agents. They're the only ones who knew who he was. But that's what celebrity entrepreneurship is really all about, being a celebrity in the eyes of just a, a small target market of key people who control the purse strings. Mm -hmm. 
And as a result of him being the king of Hollywood, the way he was, he sold $3 billion worth of movie tickets over the course of his career. You know, that, in those days, that was a lot of money. <laughs> It's a lot of money now. I mean, I mean, three billion dollars then is probably worth about fifteen million a billion now. You know, it, that's that's a lot, man. But um, before I lose you, it took you eight years to write this book. You know, you said you wrote a book in one day before I said in your book. Why did it take you so long to finish this book? I knew that this was going to be an important book for me in my life, and I and I needed to do it justice. You know, it's like. Once I had the idea that I was going to write all the smartest stuff that I learned from men, the wisdom of the men, that this was going to be something that men could really use as a powerful tool in their life, you know, like you said, you listened to it seven times. I mean, that's why, that's why I, I had so much reverence when I was getting ready to write this book. It took me five years before I went to Venice, Italy. And when I got to Venice, Italy, I was so inspired by the ingenuity and the creativity and the beauty and genius of the city of Venice, Italy, that I thought to myself, if I could just spend a couple of weeks in Venice, Italy, I could write Wisdom of the Men and be so inspired that it would do it justice. So we went to Venice, Italy in the fall of 2019, and then Italy was closed for two years because of COVID. And as soon as Italy opened up again, I booked myself into the top hotel in Venice, Italy, and they gave us a beautiful suite. And I spent two weeks in Venice, Italy, writing this book. And, you know, I, I wanted to give myself the time and I wanted to write it in the right place because I knew where I wrote the book would make a big difference. So why is that? Why, where you wrote the book? Is it just the, the energy in uh, Italy? Oh, man, the energy. I mean, Venice, Italy used to be the capital of commerce in the world. You know, and for a guy who graduated from the best business school in the world, I, I relate to the energy of Venice, Italy. I mean, in those days, it was a, a, a sea, a seaborne trade system. You know, if you had ships, you could go to Asia and bring back stuff and, you know, make a lot of money that way. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, if you've never been to Italy, to Venice, Italy, when you go there, you're going to be. I've been. Oh, you've been. There. I've been. I've been one of my best friends is actually Italian. And after college, she moved back home to Italy. And um, I went to visit them. I was in Milano and um, it was I was in the city. So I didn't get to see the beaches and all that stuff. Um, it was cool. And I went there because there were two birthdays. <laughs> Each day out there, there was a birthday. I was there Friday, Saturday. I went off to uh, Switzerland to visit another friend. And um, it was cool to see. Just like the culture, how people, you know, because the customs, when they were dancing, they were singing songs, they were singing songs native to like their their town. And you can see how people were doing these family dances and, and things like that. And then also I saw Italian people who were darker than me. And I asked my friend, I was like, man, what the hell is going on? Man? And he told me, he said, well, before Italy was Italy, you had the Sicilians, you had all these different parts of Italy. But he said thousands of years ago, Italy used to do a lot of trade with Africa and other parts of like Arabia. So a lot of those people mixed. So you had d darker Italian. So it was just, it was cool. It was cool to get like that, the little history lesson and to see the culture, see different things like that. So I had a good, I had a good experience. He told me to come out there again and go visit like their, I guess in Southern Italy, he has like a yacht or a boat or something like that. His friends do. So he's, he invited me to it. I haven't went yet. That was about, I was in Italy like three years ago, right before COVID. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe yeah. we, maybe we were in Venice at the same time because, yeah. you know, uh, I was there in October of 2019 and I was so inspired. I, I only had us there for two days because everyone said you only need two days for Venice, but they were wrong, man. When we stayed there for two weeks, that was really great. That was plenty. That was a perfect amount of time to go to Venice, Italy and, not, and take your time and enjoy it and walk around and just wander and get lost. And that's what I did. I walked around and I found places to, that inspired me and I dictated chapters of the book wow. into my phone and then had it transcribed. And, you know, I, I just wanted to put everything I had into this book. And when it was all done, like the last day I did, I did my last story. I checked them all off the list and, and I was like, wow, is that it? Is that all I got? Mm -hmm. You know, 
and there's that, you know, am I enough again thing, you know, it, even after I, I waited and developed the book for seven years and then I treated myself like a king while I was writing it so that I could give it all the best of me that I could put into it. And I put my whole life into it, including like every major celebrity in the world is in this book and five presidents of the United States. And then at the end, I'm still thinking, is that all I've got? Is that enough? Mm. Even still, I don't think that ever goes away. How do you hope the book, how do you hope your book will impact the reader? Well, hopefully you can learn through my mistakes and not make some of the same mistakes that I made. And also, hopefully you can see that no matter how low you sink, because I sank pretty freaking low, no matter how low you sink, it's never too late to transform your life and become the person you always wanted to be. Like Jimmy Carter said, President Carter, he said, if you don't like the person you've been all your life, you could become a new person today. <laughs> and I really believe that it is true. It, it, it you is. may not transform overnight, but you know, when I, when I finally met Tony Robbins, I got a text message from Tony Robbins team and it said, Hey, Clint, if you donate $25,000 to Tony's favorite charity, which was Tim Ballard, you know, that new movie that's number one at the box office, uh, The Sound of Freedom. Yeah. That's about Tim Ballard rescuing children who've been in child trafficking. And mm -hmm. uh, I donated that $25,000 in less than 60 seconds. And I'm saying this not to impress you, but only to lead into this story. When I saw Tony that night, I said, Tony, when I was a taxi driver 20 years ago, I couldn't even afford the CDs of personal power, your transformation experience. I had to buy the cassette tapes because they were $30 cheaper. But tonight I was sitting in the front row and he goes, I'm so happy for you, brother. I'm so glad everything worked out. Boom. He gives me a big kiss on the cheek. He gives me a hug. I go, Tony, what's the most important thing you ever learned? He said, life is happening for us. So, you know, hopefully the stories of my life can help you to navigate rough waters and, and inspire you to take your life where you really want it to go so that you don't have to live life like you're already dead. Last question. What advice would you give your younger self? Well, uh, the most important thing in life is who you are. And by that, I have a very specific definition. Who you are is who you are seen to be by yourself and by others. So you need to work on your self-image and your public image. That's why kids are so smart today. You know, there's, a, there's been uh, surveys like, what, what do you really want? And most of the kids today just want to be famous. That's smart because being somebody special is the best thing you can do for your own self-image and for the way people see you. And ultimately, you want people to love you. And if you want people to love you, you need to be somebody special in your own eyes and in their eyes. I really believe that. And, you know, there's going to be people who say, you know, I, I just love my husband just because of who he is. Okay, that's great. But, you know, for me, uh, I, I was so low and so beat down after 13 years of chasing the Hollywood dream and driving a taxi for six years, which was the lowest low job you could get in Hollywood. Uh, I, I had to rebuild my self-esteem and, and my own concept of who I was from nothing, from rock bottom. And if I could do that, if I could dig myself out of that ditch and become the man that I am today, then truly anything is possible. Clint Arthur. Thank you for being on the show. I enjoyed listening to your book. I honestly listened to it seven times because I felt like every time I listened to it, I can relate to every story that you share. And I'm actually in the hustle stage of my life. So that's why it was so, um, why it resonated with me so much. But um, yes, thank you for being here, man. And um, I'll catch you next time.